All right. Thank you for coming, everyone. Yat e. Yat e shik edo shidane. She e Melanie Yazi nisha. Bilagana nishle ma ide shkijni bashish chin. Bilagana dasha chero tchotsoni dasha nala. Behao gede de nasha. Akut awaz adane nishle. Hia hen sago, all of you, for coming. Uh, my name is Melanie Yazi. I am Dene. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation. I am an indigenous guest here in Minishota Makoche. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and that's what brought me here to Minishota Makoche last year. I'm very new here, um, but I'm a co founder of the Red Nation, which is the organization uh, that has sponsored tonight's event here, this teach in. Uh, co founded the Red Nation nine years ago in November of 2014 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Of course, the Southwest is my homelands as a Diné person. Uh, thank you for having me here, especially to my Dakota relatives, my Ocheti Shakoi relatives. Uh, and thank you for coming tonight. Um, why don't you all introduce yourselves here at the beginning and then we'll get going with things. And then I'll call Anthony up afterward if that's okay. So I'll just pass it off to you, Demetrius. Okay. Hello, Yat A. She Demetrius Johnson Dasha Jene. Twitterchini initially, Adel sitting on Jenny Bush's chin. Sanji can aid us a chair or Twitterchini and Shanella. Twithon a dinner shand or Akut Ego de Nehestin initially. My name is Demetrius Johnson. Everyone calls me D. I'm a long time member of the Red Nation, been in this organization for eight years. Um, but I originally live in a in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. I call it Ganado, Arizona. Uh, my home is where my belly button's uh, buried. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm up here helping uh, just, uh, just relatives and just being here in uh, the, the Twin Cities for, for a moment. But it's good to be here. Ubiak Gindi, Singiku, Navitawa Kawan Kapovi, Justine Tiba, Kak. Good evening, everyone. My name is Justine Tiba. I am from the Pueblos of Santa Clara, Tesuki, and Acoma in New Mexico. I am, uh, while well, my partner lives in Sioux Falls, and I kind of stay here pretty often. So <laughs> thank you all for having me up here. And uh, I am also a member of the Red Nation, and I'm staff with Red Media, who is. Uh, Sponsoring the publication of this event. Thank you. Amitaki api, nape chuzapi, chante washte. My name is Nick Estes. I am also a co founder of the Red Nation. I didn't actually realize we're nine years old, um, which is amazing. Um, I'm also a lead editor uh, with uh, Red Media, and I am Kui Chasha um, Lakota from born and raised in South Dakota. It's really amazing to be here with all of my comrades. You know, Dimitri has been with us for eight years, Justine was seven, and of course Nick and I have been with the Red Nation since the beginning in November of 2014. Uh, if people don't know who the Red Nation is, we're an indigenous, we're a grassroots indigenous organization that advocates for the liberation of native people and all people, including the earth from colonialism and capitalism, which I think uh, is especially important right now as we witness um, the genocide in Gaza, the righteous struggle for decolonization and liberation, national liberation that our Palestinian relatives um, are waging in this moment. Um, very brave, very harrowing. Uh, we think it's incredibly important as indigenous people of Turtle Island to speak very clearly and directly. Um, we don't fall into settler traps of discourse <laughs> and the kind of accusations that white settlers throw back and back and forth at each other here in Turtle Island. Um, the United States also built on stolen land like the settler nation of Israel does not have the authority to speak in this place and on this land. It is the indigenous people who belong to indigenous nations that predate the advent of the United States and that will be here after the United States is gone. <laughs> <laughs> that have the authority, that's right. <laughs> take off my mask, okay. Okay, I was asked to take off my mask. Uh, and so it is from this position that we speak um, as indigenous people on Palestine. Uh, 
I'm not going to take up too much time here at the beginning because I think my comrades have some really incredible things to say. But I'll just give you a bit of rundown for how we're going to proceed this evening. Then I'm going to invite my comrade Anthony up to give a brief announcement and then we'll get right into it. OK, uh, so we're going to do the teach in here at the beginning and the teach in will essentially be each of my Red Nation comrades speaking for about 10 minutes about a certain aspect of, of our perspective on the Palestinian liberation struggle. Um, after we conclude with this section, uh, we're gonna open it up for some community announcements from some of our indigenous relatives here locally. Um, and then we're gonna move into a panel. We're gonna invite three incredible community organizers um, and comrades up here to respond to what Red Nation has shared at the first half. Uh, and then after the panel um, of our community comrades are here, we're gonna be in a bit of a conversation and then we'll do Q and A with the audience. Real quickly, Q and A, um, we're going to hand out index cards. If you have a question, please write it down. We're not going to do like a live Q and A. Um, and then the index cards will be passed to me and we probably won't be able to get to everyone's questions, but I'll probably, I'll try to pick maybe two or three that we can answer before time. Uh, we have to be out of here by 6.30. <laughs> so I just want to be mindful of time um, and make sure that maybe we have enough volunteers at the end to make sure that everything is cleaned up um, before we're good to go. And I think that's it. There's food, please. Feel free to come and go. Help yourself to the food and the beverages outside. There's coffee. It can't be an Indian event without coffee. That would be really tragic. No matter what time of day it is. Could be an all-night ceremony and you still need coffee. Um, and we have some Red Nation swag right in the back by the two Palestinian flags. There's stickers. There's um, Red Media bookmarks. Please take as much as you would like. I have a big old bag that weighs 20 pounds in my bag. I can replenish it if things run out. Uh, and I think that's it for how we're going to go about things. Anthony, do you want to just come up here for a moment and just introduce yourself? Okay, round of applause for our comrade Anthony, who's really the person who made this happen. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Anthony. I'm a member of the anti-war committee. Um, just... <laughs> I'm uh, just going to say a couple words. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it's really great to see everybody here. Uh, the Anti-War Committee is really proud to organize alongside the Red Nation in the Free Palestine Coalition. Um, every single organization that's a part of the, the Free Palestine Coalition has been nose to the ground every single day in order to make sure that these actions, that these civil disobediences go off in a way that's effective, and we're going to keep fighting. Um, but a little bit about the Anti-War Committee... <laughs> Uh, really quickly, uh, the anti-war committee believes in the right of nations to self-determination. And that means that we don't tell oppressed people and oppressed nations how they should be liberated. All that it means is that we stand with them in their struggle for liberation because we in the anti-war committee understand that we live inside of the belly of the beast. And so I'll leave you on this. What that means is that we stand in unconditional solidarity with the Palestinian people in the struggle for Palestinian liberation. And that also means that we stand for land back and the struggle for self-determination from Turtle Island to Palestine. That's it. Thank you. Yes, thank you for setting that tone and context, Anthony. Um, land back is non-negotiable. I mean, you're hearing people on social media saying like, oh, land back, like genocide. Does this mean genocide? No, but land back is, is going to happen. That's going to happen, the indigenous perspective in Turtle Island and how we understand what is also happening in Palestine. And what we really want you to take away tonight is, as Anthony said, we're in the belly of the beast, right? We're all indigenous people who come from nations that are under occupation by the United States government. And of course the US bank rolls on um, the Israeli occupation of Palestinian land. They're one and the same really. And so it's our responsibility as people who are within the United States to go as hard as possible to decolonize this place because that will reverberate all across the world because the US is the greatest predator empire that has ever existed, right? And so we want US out of everywhere we want U.S. out of Palestine. We want U.S. out of Turtle Island, right? And that the goal is to dismantle the, the settler project that is the United States um, for the freedom and the, the future of all life on this planet. Um, it very much depends upon that. 
so I'm going to pass it off to Comrade Nick, who's going to get us started, and then Justine and then Demetrius, and then I'll wrap it up. Thank you so much. I just want to position us where we are today, which is in Minnesota Mokoche, which means land where the water reflects the sky. That encompasses the three elements necessary for life, land, water, and air, right? And I think it's such a beautiful phrase that has been bastardized by the settler state because it is premised on the genocide of Dakota people and the oppression of our Ojibwe relatives, our Anishinaabe relatives. This has global consequences. And I wanna talk about that before I move into the question of why indigenous people in the belly of the beast in North America and Turtle Island need to stand with Palestine and why decolonization is or should be the normative default position of any social justice movement here. So first of all, let's look around us. We have street names that are named after genociders. We have a concentration camp that is literally, a Fort Snelling, that is literally protected by historic preservation laws. Everywhere we turn in this settler colonial state, we see genocide and we see the celebration of genociders. Imagine that the Soviet Union had not liberated Eastern Europe. It would be named after the genociders of Nazi Germany. It would bear the names and the processes and the systems. Everywhere we turn as, as native people in this country, we are confronted by the reality that this country is premised on our elimination, to destroy us, to replace us. Today, we live in a state that justifies that genocide with soft words, with kind phrases, with land acknowledgments, with gestures towards decolonization, because it believes as a settler society that it can acknowledge that it has stolen our land, our wealth, our livelihoods, our children, our resources, from the relative comfort, knowing that the mere acknowledgement doesn't change the colonial reality. It doesn't change the social material reality that we live in because it does not want to give up what it has taken. The prime example is my employer, the University of Minnesota, which seized Dakota land in the midst of Dakota expulsion and genocide and sold it to build the wealth not only of the university through a land grant, but also the wealth of this state. It accumulated that land that it sold and privatized and enclosed into what is called a permanent university fund. That permanent university fund was then used as a bonding agency for the state so that municipalities, counties could draw down loans from this permanent university fund to build roads, to build bridges, to build the very infrastructure that has built the wealth of this state. This state is built not just on Dakota land, it is built on the stolen wealth of Dakota people and, it is it, and, the, and their blood and their death, period. That is the reality. That is the material reality. And there are still laws on the books today through the Abrogation Act and the Removal Act that forbid and exile, by law, Dakota people. Sure, we have four Dakota communities, but by and large, the majority of Dakota people, and Ocheti Shakoi people, live in exile from this state. Think about that every time you say the word Minnesota. Minnesota Makoche, Minnesota Makoche. It comes from our worldview, our relationship to this land, the sacred traditions that we hold in this specific area called Badote, which is an emergent site, a site, a sacred site. Think about that. We cannot comprehend in this moment in time the immense amount of loss and violence that it required to build not only the state of Minnesota, but 
the United States as we know it today. All the hundreds of thousands of native people that had to be dispossessed, not only here in Turtle Island, but across the Pacific through ongoing military occupation, just so that this country can exist today. This is a known secret to the Israeli settler colonial project. If you listen to the settler, the illegal settlers who are invading the West Bank, they cite, they said, hey, you did it, so we can do it. This is our frontier. How dare you judge us for something that you benefit from directly? So there's an ideological justification, understanding, and an implicit justification, understanding that genocide is the premise, the very premise of building the United States. And of course, that en encompasses a large, you know, um, multiple, you know, different histories, such as the enslavement and the genocide of our African brothers and sisters, the, the forced migration of imperialist wars that the United States has waged throughout this hemisphere and throughout the world that have brought people to these lands. And so we're all positioned within US empire according to this settler colonial project, period. That is the premise by which the United States has allied itself with the state of Israel. Post-1948, the United States didn't really want anything to do with Israel. It hadn't taken a strong position. Uh, Truman was president at the time. Sorry to bore you with history, but Truman was president at the time. He didn't really have a strong allegiance or an ideological commitment. And this is, you know, of course, um, you know, following World War II. And the excuse that the Zionists make is that Israel was the solution or the sort of the reparations for the Nazi genocide, which we know that the Zionists within Israel at that particular time actually didn't like Holocaust survivors because they felt that they were weak. It wasn't until 1967 when the Israeli army defeated Arab countries that the United States said, hey, wait a minute, this could be in our strategic interest to invest in a military project here so that the United States can project its power within the region. Not only that, we can put, in ch we can put into check the resources in that region. No longer we, do we have to deal with these Arab countries that control oil, right? Does this sound familiar in the United States when it comes to indigenous people? Of course it does. These ideological justifications, oh, saying that, you know, this country has the right to exist, this country has the right to exist, what it really comes down to is strategic interests, both militarily and economic. The United States didn't come to this land just because they were just like interested in creating civilization. They came to this land because we had copper in the Iron Range. We had land. We had land to be sold because settlers didn't bring anything with them. So they had to take what was already there for free. So when we think about this ideological connection to the United States and Israel, it only makes sense that the United States would back Israel. So the justification for genocide, for mass murder, for continued war, not just in Palestine and in a, in, in a war against Palestinians, but throwing the entire region into constant turmoil. The United States invaded Iraq twice. How many millions of Iraqis did the United, was the United States responsible for killing during the war on terror? How many Afghanis? How many Syrians? The list is endless. And the recent death of you know, one of the key architects of this kind of strategic projection of power, Henry Kissinger, died a free man, knowing that he was responsible for millions of deaths across the world. In the, entrance, in the interest of American empire. He is a, an example. There's a reason why Hillary Clinton, why every Department of State, Anthony Blinken, doesn't matter which party they are from, holds 
Henry Kissinger on a pedestal because he died, he lived a century as a free man, as a war criminal. Because the United States knows that it will act with impunity when it comes to the destruction of other nations and other people. Because it did it with us and it just exported that project to the rest of the world. Now, I want to turn, you know, I don't have very much time, but I want to turn to the question of decolonization. Palestinians, from the very beginning, this didn't happen in 1948. The colonization process didn't happen in 1948. It preceded that by, you know, almost a century. When the British, you know, saw this place as an area, it colonized it, right? Uh, it issued the Balfour Declaration in 1917 as a solution to its anti-Semitism, saying we can send the Jewish people we don't want in our country to somewhere else. So it's important to put this into context. It wasn't just the Nakba in 1948. This is a long-going European colonial project. So when we talk about things like right of return, land back, Typically, what you'll hear in the media in the United States is a moralization or equivalent around phrases such as from the river to the sea. Netanyahu's Likud party had it as its founding, in its founding uh, party document, Zionist, uh, you know, it's a very right-wing Zionist party, that Israeli sovereignty will exist from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. But nobody called out Netanyahu for being an anti-Palestinian because anti-Palestinianism, anti-being hating Palestinians in the United States is the default position. Much like hating indigenous people is the default position. What other country has a monument to a, a concentration camp of the people that they genocided? Ask yourself that. When any, when Governor Walls, whoever is from the state, is looking at you and saying Palestinian lives don't matter, is like, yeah, because indigenous lives don't matter here. Just like black lives don't matter to your, to, your, to your country as well. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to say those things. And so when Palestinians demand the right of return, which exists under international law, and it doesn't need to exist under international law for that to be a moral imperative, by the way. International law hasn't done anything to stop the genocide, and, and in many ways has alibied the genocide against Palestinians. But when they say from the river to the sea, it is a projection by the Zionists and their supporters and backers in the United States that the only end result is genocide because it is an implicit acknowledgement that what Israel is doing and has done and what the United States is doing and has done is a genocidal project. It is their projection on our movements for their crimes because they can't imagine anything else but genocide because that's the only thing they've been doing. And it's important to point that out because when we say back in 1999, I remember when the question of the, the return of Hisapa, our sacred black hills in Western South Dakota within our treaty lands, within our, you know, it's the center of our cosmos as Lakota people was being discussed. The first thing that came out was white settlers saying, well, you're going to do to us what you, we did to you. That's a morally bankrupt position, in my opinion, because you can only imagine one solution, which is genocide and expulsion. That means that we are out of political alternatives within the settler colonial nation that we exist in because it cannot imagine justice for all. It cannot enact justice for all. It is not a normative position to say that decolonization not only is an, uh, is a, an imperative, but it is a necessity for life on this planet. Because if you think about what is happening right now when, the, when Israel recommenced or re-intensified its genocidal campaign after this you know, short ceasefire, it's happening amidst COP28, where the world's leaders are supposed to be hammering out a future for this planet 
that doesn't involve it burning. But currently, we can see that the question of Palestine has divided the world between the majority who want peace and justice, who want a, a just, sustainable future, and the very minority who want to maintain systems of oppression, specifically settler colonialism and the genocidal project that's happening in Gaza right now. In the same, in the same instance, you have a billionaire who was born in apartheid kissing the ground of another apartheid country and saying that he is the solution for climate change, announcing the Cybertruck, which is inaccessible to everybody because this settler colonial system, whether it's in Tel Aviv or Washington, holds the future hostage for the rest of the planet. It's not an Indian problem. It's not a Palestinian problem. It's everybody's problem. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you for setting the scene, Nick. Um, so I have been a member of the Red Nation since the fall of 2019. And I'll admit that when I first joined, I um, didn't know why Palestine. I, um, I was, I, I guess, like almost confused even, <laughs> like why the Red Nation was so gung-ho for free Palestine. And um, now that I've been in the Red Nation, I know exactly why we are so gung-ho for free Palestine. And that's because pal free Palestine is the tip of the spear. This is the only issue that we've seen or, uh, come up that like truly unites the entire left. Everyone left of center is free Palestine. And this is, this is the uniting cause that we're seeing right now. Um, and I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the work that we've done throughout the years. When I, um, so I actually, um, a year after I joined the Red Nation, I had the honor and privilege of going to Palestine on a delegation with the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights and Eyewitness Palestine. And I saw for myself um, everything there. And at the same time, during that same uh, fall of 2018, that's when the Red Nation wrote our first political position, uh, Palestine represents an alternative future for native nations. Um, and ever since um, everything popped off, um, every week we are releasing content and media uh, talking about our analysis as the Red Nation and really just doing everything in our power to educate um, everyone about this. We're trying to get tribes to sign on to, um, to uh, um, you know, um, moving towards Free Palestine. Uh, we launched a website, indigenousforpalestine.org, where right now we're at over 676 signatures um, of Native people who are who agree on um, decolonization. But um, I also wanted to um, really express um, what that means, and I can't think of a better example than uh, when we went to the historic march on November 4th in Washington, D.C., the March for Palestine, and it was there. Uh, you probably heard this speech before if you've been in the streets, um, but it was there where uh, five or six of us in the Red Nation uh, wrote this, and um, we say, today we deliver a devastating blow to colonialism. As indigenous people of Turtle Island, we proclaim that decolonization and land back are the only forms of justice for the crimes of settler colonialism. Native people, unfortunately, have been here before. We know the entire history and future of Palestine because we have lived it. We endure the settler colonial project that calls itself the United States. We survived the elimination and removal of our ancestors, and we are in our fifth century of resistance. We know that Palestine's future is a certain future because we are still here. Yet, Palestine represents an alternative path for the native nations of Turtle Island. In this moment of our shared history, Palestine brings us closer than ever than ever before to the promise of true self-determination for all colonized peoples of the world. 
We fulfill our ancestors' dreams by standing with Palestine today. Palestine is the tip of the spear that steers us all toward liberation. Settler colonialism holds nothing back, and yet it cannot defeat those whose cries for liberation resound louder than any bomb they can drop on us. Colonialism is failing, crumbling under the weight of its own conceit. The fort is breached and the wagons are burning. The end of colonialism nears because the end of colonialism is inevitable. The United States wages wars to maintain its position as the supreme settler colony of the world. Ours is the oldest struggle against U.S. colonialism. Now is the chance to redeem your humanity, settlers of our stolen lands, by standing with Palestine and standing with us. The end of U.S. imperialism is the only solution for us, for Palestine, and for the world. Mark our words. The humble people of the earth have spoken. There is no place for colonialism on Mother Earth. For the earth to live, colonialism must die. A free Palestine frees us all to build a future of peace and equality. Today, we join our Palestinian relatives in a righteous struggle to author a new society. To our relatives in Gaza, we say that in the Navajo language, together we are strong. May our message carry far across the sea. Gaza, Gaza, you will see. Palestine will truly be free. And we read that to a crowd of 600,000 people. And that's what it's about. That's what I learned when I went to Palestine, even before. Um, what I learned is that this is a struggle. We are we have the exact same struggle as Native people here in Turtle Island, because this is a struggle against settler colonialism. I am not indigenous because of my language or my tribe or my ties to the land. I'm indigenous because it is a political position in the constructs of settler colonialism. If settler colonialism had never happened, I would just be Tewatoa or Kohayahanu or... Um, or, or Akume, I would be from my nations because settler colonialism never existed. So therefore, Palestinians are indigenous because of their political position in the constructs of settler colonialism. And... And, that, and, and that's why we say that Palestine is the tip of the spear for our struggle here on Turtle Island, because the winds for land back and decolonization that happen in Palestine are very much winds for us here and vice versa. When, um, and, and that fills me and us in the Red Nation with just immense hope that this can be done because what we're seeing in Palestine right now is a win. What we're seeing in Gaza right now is a win. I know that we are devastated and I know that we have lost so many innocent people. I know how many children that we have lost. But do you know what else we're seeing? Is that Israel and the United States are not in control. They are not in control right now. We are seeing them out there with their entire ass and they're still failing. They have arms and they have bombs because they're cowards. They're not winning and they're not in control. And they, when I say that they're winning, their original demands are being met. There are free Palestinian prisoners right now because let's remember what this is all about. This is about the freedom of people who have been locked up by the, by colonizers for simply existing as an indigenous person in an occupation. And that's the same battles we have here. Free Leonard Peltier, if you want to free Palestine. <laughs> and, 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 that, and that's what this ultimately is about. This is a battle of ending settler colonialism once and for all. We have, we know it can be done because Palestine is proving to us all that it can be done. And that's why supporting indigenous movements here and uplifting indigenous movements is a win for Palestine. And when we, um, 
when we um just uh when we dismantle like like uh and i guess what i'm trying to say is that the indigenous struggle here isn't simply to vote isn't simply to protest it is to give the land back it is to deconstruct the settler state in every stage that it, it exists the united states does not have a right to exist israel does not have a right to exist australia new zealand all of these settler colonial projects do not have a right to exist and so when we're thinking about what we want to do we're not going to come up with actions where we're going to target the democratic party for not doing enough because that's their party that's the settler state why are we putting our energy into voting and into uplifting these settler state candidates when we need to be building indigenous nations as an alternative to building that power to deconstruct deconstruct settler colonialism and that's what nick is saying that this is not just an indian problem do not project settler values onto the struggles of decolonization because they because uh, this is not just an indian problem a, a, a decolonized world is a free world for all it doesn't matter if you're indigenous or not we all need clean water And, and with that, I just um, I, I just want to end with a plan uh, I, with a plan forward. Maybe I can talk about it a little bit later. But the Red Deal. If you haven't read read our book yet, if you haven't looked on our website, like that's literally our plan. That is what we want to how we see a, decol a decolonial struggle moving forward in the United States. Let's divest from occupation. The United States military is the largest military in the world that spans. A, 800 bases across the world. Imagine if we defunded just one of those bases. How much money is that? How much housing is that? How much food is that for people? Divest from occupation and reinvest in our common humanity and our, and our earth. The United States owes us here in Turtle Island and people across the world climate debt to clean up the mess that they made. And so let's make that happen. Thank you. Oh, man. So I'm going to get a little bit uh, Dine-centric because I'm a little bit pissed off. Um, 1864 uh, was the beginning of the, the Long Walk campaign uh, enacted against Diné people by the U.S. Uh, military. Um, it was a four-year campaign to uh, re forcibly relocate Diné people all the way to, uh, uh, to uh, Fort Sumner. Um, it was a, it was over, it was hundreds of miles of, of forced relocation of thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of Navajos. Um, we stayed there at Fort Sumner for four years. And what we call that campaign is Huelde, which, trans, which translates to, uh, to hell or like a place of immense suffering. Um, many elders, many children, um, died on that, on that walk to get to Fort Sumner because if you take a direct path, it's, it's still long, but what the U S government decided to do was to march them around Santa Fe Plaza, go through the mountains during the winter, and then finally go down to Fort Sumner. Um, and that's where a majority of our elders and our, and our young, our, our children, uh, perished. And the conditions in Fort Sumner were also just unbearable. Um, Cold, win cold winters, uh, lack of uh, access to water, to food. Um, and it, it ju justifiably received its name, Huelde. And, I, and I, tell this, I tell you this because this is, this is our story. This is like our, our interactions with, with settler colonialism, with the U.S. government, and what they do to indigenous people and what they did to my people. It's something that a lot of my people know the history of. And so it confuses me of why my people don't get behind the people of Gaza, the people of Palestine. If we understand our shared history of resistance against these settler colonial projects, and if we see what is happening to Gazans right now, 
being forcibly relocated, being killed on their way to relocation. Why, why would we stand idly by? We're literally seeing our own, well, uh, we're literally seeing another well day happen to indig- to another group of indigenous people. Why wouldn't we speak up? And it's frustrating for me as a Diné person to, to see, to see our people, to see our, our so-called leaders standing by, not even acknowledging, not even saying anything about what is happening in Palestine. And Dr. Mel here, actually, how I learned about Palestine is the uh, same thing as Justine, is through the Red Nation. But uh, Dr. Mel here, along with uh, a few other Diné colleagues, started a uh, Diné for Palestine out there in the Navajo Nation in the early 2010s, um, way before I was politicized. And they also advocated, like, why, aren't, why, aren't our, why isn't our Navajo leadership, why isn't our people getting behind Palestine? And to this day, like, our, our government actually goes backwards. They side with, with, with the Israeli government. We we were so evangelical, evangelical side. <laughs> can't say the word. We're so Christianized, um, and not not in the in the in the Palestinian dope Christianized. We're like in the bad like white supremacist <laughs> Christianized, um, and we 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 allow Israeli propaganda to infiltrate our Diné people, our our young Diné people, and so I I I. I guess what I'm saying is like, it's important to understand your history. It's important to read. It's important to educate yourself because what, what I'm seeing and what a lot of um, young Diné people are seeing is like our, our leadership is inadequate. They're, I guess I, what I would say is like, now is not the time to be de or stupid or dumb. Now's the time to be decolonized. Now is the time to like educate yourself, to understand that, what is happening in Gaza, what is happening to our Palestinian people is no different than what has happened to us and continues to happen to us. I went to Palestine in 2018 with a delegation from the Palestinian youth movement. And it was the first time that, I don't know, that I've seen people that are so identical to us because Diné people are sheep herders too. And going to Palestine and seeing like how many people, you know, herd sheep that, that eat sheep, that have a cuisine dedicated to sheep. I was just like, whoa, I'm at a home away from home. And not only that, there was the, the resourcefulness because you're displaced from your own area. I guess I'm talking about the, our, our, the, our Bedouin relatives who have homes built out of like plywood and and tarp the same way my grandma's house looks i have so many pictures that with their sheep corrals with their homes that look exactly like my relatives homes back in ganado and for me i was just like wow this is a place where like i i i don't know like how we don't know about these people when they're so identical to us there's a place in uh in so called biersheva that has like a huge, a huge um, electrical generating station. And the Bedouin villages live below these transmission lines. And it's no different from like how my relatives live, where over 10,000 Navajos still don't have access to electricity, even though we supply our, our lands, our resources supply electricity to the greater Southwest, talking metropolitans like phoenix las vegas california even albuquerque which is where i live and us not having access to to electricity to resources even though our lands provide those things it's uh it just makes me wonder why like why why my again why my nations and why other other indigenous nations haven't signed on to our letter that we wrote haven't spoken up about this issue and I think now, if, if there's ever a time for us to understand what decolonization is, what a livable plan, what a livable future is, just like my, my, my comrades here have said, now's the time. Now's the time to get activated. Now's the time to, to organize because I don't see, like, 
if we if if now is not the time to act, I don't see like a livable future for for all of us. If we like really like Gaza is like the tipping point for for freedom, not just for Palestinians, but for all indigenous people and for all life on Earth. Um, and that's just the that's just the reality. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank my comrades for their very powerful, very um, direct, clear-minded words. And the reason why I say this, you know, for like Dine people, they say that your words and your breath is sacred. Like it's a sacred wind that comes out and our words have power. There's this Haudenosaunee feminist who wrote this line, a, a book about um, the Six Nations land struggle. Um, and the book came in, in 2006. And she said, you know, with nothing more than words, Indigenous people changed history on the international arena. And indigenous, it is true, Indigenous people are extremely oppressed <laughs> in the United States. Our numbers were very small, right, compared to the settler population in the United States. But what we can offer, right, what we can offer to the struggle for the liberation of Palestine and for the struggle for liberation of all people is our words, it's our stories, it's our memory, and it's our refusal to relinquish who we are and the relationship, the original relationship we have with this land. We will never be moved from that. We will never leave, right? And we will never forget. And I think for me, that is what we offer, right, to our Palestinian relatives. Um, who are facing so much suffering, extreme settler violence in this moment. We, we are the memory of a long struggle, and we are the embodiment of the future that our ancestors struggled for and the dream of liberation that all colonized and oppressed people share. And we are here, you know, to remind the world that even after 500 years, <laughs> right, that this is something that has not gone away. And in fact, it will never go away, no matter how much you suffer and how much you lose. And I think that is what we have to offer um, our Palestinian relatives, in addition to solidarity and the things that we might do, having the moral authority as the original people of these lands um, to push back against the violent settler project that is the United States, um, and to help to lead that, to be the tip of the spear here of all liberation struggles in the movements that seek to seek a world of justice, equality, and peace um, that seek to dismantle the United States. I hope you seek to dismantle the United States. And if that isn't your politics, okay. <laughs> I speak as if everybody has this commitment. Um, and the thing is, is that you should. You should listen to indigenous people when they're telling you that this is the goal. And that not only is this the goal, but this is the starting point. Because I think Nick articulated this very clearly. Um, a decol decolonization is the only thing that is going to save us as a species is the only thing that's going to save us as a planet and everyone should just be on board with it no questions asked and I say this sometimes on the podcast our Red Nation podcast and the co-host of Red Power Hour you know like of the most oppressed ass people in Turtle Island indigenous women are like on the top of that fucking list okay and incarcerated at higher numbers, murdered at higher numbers, missing at higher numbers, higher levels of rape and all kinds of sexual violence and sexual harassment. I mean, indigenous women struggle so hard under the settler regime that is the United States and the way that heteropatriarchy ties so closely into that. And if an indigenous woman is telling you that decolonization is the solution and also that there is real hope and that Palestine offers us, we, we said this in the speech, Palestine is the alternative path for native nations. And this is because we understand Palestine and the liberation of Palestine is the tip of the spear, right? It is a righteous struggle and it is so powerful that it has literally in 60 days changed the entire world. The entire world has changed. I knew it. I knew at the moment that it happened that nothing, and I mean nothing for colonizers or for any of the good humble people of the earth would be the same ever again. And we need to lean into that, 
Lean into the fact that colonizers are scared. Lean in to scaring them <laughs> and making them feel uncomfortable, right? It is because, it is because we have power. And sometimes being here in Minnesota, uh, it's real different organizing here. And it's also very different being indigenous here than it is from where I came from in Albuquerque. I find sometimes people here feel like they don't have power, especially native people and other folks. Like we have power. This is why millions of people are standing up for Palestine across the world. Like we have power. If we didn't have power, they wouldn't go so hard to silence the people. And Palestine, one of the things I have also been, had the honor of going to Palestine in 2011 on a decolonial field school when I was working on my PhD at the University of New Mexico. Palestine not only reminded me of my own humanity as a person living under occupation here, but Palestine taught me so much about the commitment to decolonization and samud, that steadfastness, right? That word again and again, what does it mean to be steadfast in your commitment for decolonization? And I think that that is something in my long path of political development and my journey since we started the Red Nation, that indigenous revolutionaries here have also taught me that steadfastness. And I encourage you all, to, you know, when we leave this event tonight, have that steadfastness, carry it in your heart. Do not let it go because we will win. And we know this because we have been doing this for hundreds of years. And even like I said, we've lost so much. We still believe we're going to win. We still will have the relationship with the land, right? We really believe this. And if indigenous people are telling you this, and if Palestinians are telling you this, then you better damn believe it yourself. <laughs> We're gonna win. <laughs> so I wanted to, I'll, I wanted to hand it over to um, someone who wanted to come up and make an announcement, Nick, and then we'll transition into the panel because I don't want to take up too much more time. Good evening. My name is Nicole Mason. I am an organizer. I am an organizer at Nenakasi Healing Camp, where we are engaged in a life affirming battle for all people. Every day we experience the impacts of, of the generational trauma of settler colonism. Every day we also see hope. And for every loss we experience wins as well. We know that indigenous liber liberation is liberation for everyone. Nenakasi is primarily indigenous. However, we welcome relatives of all races. We are here in solidarity with Palestine. This is a fight for all, for all futures. A free Palestine frees us all. Our Jewish and Muslim relatives in the Middle East and our black, brown and indigenous relatives here on these lands. When we stand for liberation and freedom from relatives in Pan Palestine, we also stand for the freedom and liberation of all our relatives here on Turtle Island, where we continue to face oppression. Since joining the relatives outside, we have been able to hold down space with increased safety. This stability has made it possible for people to access spiritual, emotional, and physical healing resources, housing, and to build strong community. Together, 74 people have been housed and zero people have died from overdose. We have received word from the city of Minneapolis that our community will be evicted on December 14th. And we are here to ask for your solidarity. We are working to stop eviction because eviction is violent and results in overdose, disease spread, assault, missing people, and the deaths of our relatives. To that end, we invite you to connect with us at Nenakasi on all social media platforms to find ways to join us. There are many op opportunities such as 
public advocacy, we will be present at the December 5th city budge, budget meeting this Tuesday at 6 p.m. On Saturday, December 9th, we will be door knocking our neighborhood. On Tuesday, December 10th, we will march from the Wall of Forgotten Natives to Nenekasi, where we will hold a prayer vigil and be in ceremony. Support the camp. Starting on December 10th, there will be an increase of housed neighbors staying with residents at Nenekasi on site. We are building two yurts for our community. In addition, we are asking for presence and sitting around the fire to build relationships. Bring food and supplies, join the emergency response signal thread, and find us on social media at Camp Nenekasi. Thank you for giving space to me to speak. We are stronger together. All power to the people. We wanted, we wanted to make space for just like local organizations, uh, local native led organizations, because you know we don't want you to walk away from here thinking that there isn't anything going on in the city. And I know a lot of you are involved, um, but I, I want to turn it. I, I want to turn it over to uh, my friend and relative uh, Rachel Thunder Dion, um, who is going to talk a little bit about the Indigenous Protectors Movement, which I, I'm a proud member of as well, as well as Vinny over there. So um, I'll turn it over. Rachel Dion Thunder. Hello, thank you to everybody for coming here tonight. Thank you to the Red Nation for inviting us to come up and share some words and, you know, prayers of solidarity with Palestine and the rest of decolonization movements around the world and Turtle Island. Um, <clears throat> like Nick just said, I am one of the co-founders and board members of IPM, the Indigenous Protector Movement, with Nick, my husband, Vinny Dion, sitting over here in the matching hoodie, <laughs> so he's not hard to miss. Um, so we're a very new organization here in South Minneapolis. Um, you know, I was <clears throat> a little girl, a baby here in Minneapolis. I come from an AIM family. <clears throat> and one of our co-founders, Crow Belcourt, Jolene Jones, these are all co-founders and board members of our organization. You know, we saw <clears throat> a niche here in South Minneapolis for an organization that could build and support and uplift indigenous-led movements and actions. Um, to really provide that safe space, those resources for those voices, for those individuals, for those communities to um, really lead at a grassroots level here in Minneapolis. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> it's hard for me to reach down. Um, <clears throat> but so recently we were one of the recipients of the self-determination grant from Indian Collective, along with 72 other organizations across the country. And that kind of funding, those kind of resources are really allowing us to get up off our feet and get started. So we're getting ready to open an office here in South Minneapolis, right off of Franklin Avenue in the ancient traders building right up above Maria's. Um, so that'll be opening up this month. And <clears throat> one of our first initiatives that we're really focusing on is providing a safe space for our relatives to come in and <clears throat> report acts of violence or acts of discrimination, acts of brutality by the Minneapolis Police Department. So a lot of you know that the American Indian Movement was founded here um, kind of based around police brutality against our people as indigenous people. And recently the DOJ report that came out showed that that really hasn't changed. Fast forward from the 70s to today, our people are still being disproportionately discriminated and brutalized by MPD 
even in the aftermath of what happened to George Floyd. So part of our organization <clears throat> is that instead of our people or any people having to go to City Hall or to uh, <clears throat> to MPD to file a report against MPD, that they can come to our organization and we'll act as that buffer for them to file that report and we will stay on top of that report for transparency and accountability with the Minneapolis Police Department. So that's just our first initiative, really. Um, you know, we've also been involved in a lot of other actions. Um, you know, of course, everything with the Roof Depot and now what is going on with bituminous roadways and Smith Foundry. Um, we will continue to advocate for clean water, clean air for our people, for land back, for decolonization. And just because this is an urban area doesn't mean that those things are unobtainable. A lot of people think that those things are associated with more rural areas. And I, pull, I really truly believe that Minneapolis can be a starting point or a blueprint for what urban land back and urban decolonization can really mean for indigenous people. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna invite our panelists to come on up here. Why don't we move over, give them some space. So first, uh, Sanal Wazwaz, who is the chapter lead and education coordinator for American Muslims for Palestine. Please give Sana a well warm applause. And then we also have Jay Yates from Freedom Road, Justice, Freedom Road Socialist Organization and the Twin Cities Coalition for Justice for Jamar. And finally, we have David Gilbert Patterson um, also from Minnesota Workers United and also from Freedom Road Socialist Organization. And so real quick before we hear from you all, just comments and feedbacks about um, what Red Nation comrades have shared. Uh, can I get a couple of volunteers to pass out index cards and pens for people for Q&A if you have any of those right now? I'm just gonna grab them over here and we can come over here. Absolutely. Um, so, is this working? Okay, how much time do I have? 10 minutes. All right, just want to keep track of time. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you to the Anti War Committee, to Red Nation, to all the different, to all the folks that joined us tonight during this really devastating time. I think it's so, so vital that we, we have this sense of community, we have this sense of unity, and that we're honoring um, the indigenous people in the way that it's not, that's not performative, that's not just uh, superficial and, and artificial, that's, that's actually material, that we're sitting here and, and we're calling for actual material changes, whether that be what the panelists are saying, what Melanie was saying, or, you know, in Palestine the material changes being the end of the blockade. It's not just ceasefire, it's an end to the occupation. It's land back in Palestine as well. So I, I greatly enjoyed the panel. I love hearing uh, from my indigenous brothers and sisters. And I think I want to, um, I think, elaborate on some of the points that were made, because I think there's a lot of really, uh, really important uh, talking points that were that were brought up um, and that I'd like to substantiate. Uh, the first one is the discussion on, I guess, the colonial framework uh, that defines all of the Zionist movement historically. And we, when we refer to Zionism as a settler colonial project, I really want to stress this. This is something that was very overt and unabashed within Zionist discourse historically. This is not just a metaphor. This is not just something I, the opinionated Arab, is just getting up and saying it's a colonial blah, blah, blah. Like, I think that's a lot of times the way that we want to frame it, that it's just kind of, uh, it's just someone being opinionated or, or whatever, uh, but that's actually not the case. And right now, we're seeing a lot of revisionism within Zionist discourse. Suddenly Zionist discourse wants to claim that it's a decolonization movement. You can get a shirt on Etsy that says like decolonized Judean, which doesn't even have a nice ring to it anyway. Um, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> um, and 
when you actually look at the, the documentation, Zionist leaders, the pioneers of modern political Zionism, openly bragged about how colonial their movement is. I'm going to give a few examples. Um, one of them, if anyone knows, Zev Jabotinsky, who is the founder of the modern day Likud party. He was founder of the British Legion, excuse me, the Jewish Legion of the British Mandate Army. Um, and he wrote an essay in 1923 called The Iron Wall. How many of you, show of hands, how many of you are familiar with this essay? So about a few of you, okay, and that's and this is this is so important. So I actually like that because y'all are going to get some some bombshell info. Uh, and this essay, he basically writes a very very disgusting essay. And the premise of the essay is, we're colonizers. They're the colonized people. They're the natives, and that's it. Like we're we're colonizers, and they're not going to accept us. Why would they accept us? They're the natives, and and that's fine, right? So he has a famous line in that uh, in that essay where he says, "Zionism is a colonization adventure, which stands or falls on the question of armed forces." You can go home and literally look up this essay. Just look up Iron Wall Jabotinsky, read it, read it again, share it with everyone, and you won't you won't be surprised, but you'll be disgusted. And one of the things he says in this essay that I think is very, very relevant to today's discussion is he says, for anyone that wants to say, oh, you can't compare the colonization of the Americas to Palestine, blah, 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 you know, these fake progressives. Um, for anyone that wants to say that, he says in the essay, uh, the Zionists, or excuse me, he flips it, sorry. The Palestinians are the so and the rolling prairies. And the Zionists are the pilgrim fathers, the real pioneers of North America. He says those words verbatim. This is not a paraphrase. This is verbatim. The Palestinians are like the indigenous Americans and we, the Zionists, we are like the Pilgrim Fathers. So for anyone that wants to say that this is not a legitimate analogy, you can, you can stick it up with Jabotinsky. I don't know. <laughs> Um, this is one example. I'm going to give a couple others. Uh, one of them is Theodore Herzl, who many of you are familiar with, is often known as the, the founding father of modern political Zionism. He wrote a pamphlet called The Jewish State, um, which kind of popularized and mobilized uh, for the movement. And he wrote a letter in 1903, amongst many letters, by the way, there's like many that I can quote, but 1903, he writes a letter to Cecile Rhodes, who is the uh, prime minister of the Cape, Ca Cape, Cape Town colony, excuse me. And he says, I, you know, I'm kind of paraphrasing the first part of his quotation, but he says something like, I'm inviting you to this kind of this grand project. It's not one of Asia Minor or of Africa, and it's not one of Englishmen, but of Jews. It is something colonial. That's, that's verbatim, that's his quote. It is something colonial, right? Uh, there's a number of other examples. And one that I also, that I really want to highlight is Israel Zangwill, who is also a, a very prominent Zionist thinker. And uh, in 1911, he wrote an essay and it was called The Voice for Jerusalem. Now he was writing this essay about why he is no longer a Zionist because he had been propagating for the Zionist movement and then he changed his mind. And in the essay, he, he has this really, really incriminating quote where he says, Unless the Zionists are to go about massacring the modern Canaanites, Zionism will remain largely moonshine. So there's obvious, the obvious thing that jumps out at you, which is unless they're going to go massacring people, this is not going to work. But look at his, his language. The Palestinians are the modern Canaanites. They are the indigenous people. And this was an acknowledgement that was ubiquitous in Zionist discourse. It wasn't some fringe opinion. It wasn't like, oh, there was debate. Some of them were like, ah, are they indigenous? Are they not? There was a consensus of understanding that the people that lived there were the natives of the land. And at that time, colonialism was cool. Before World War II, colonialism wasn't just cool. Colonialism was amazing. And it was something to brag about. But now suddenly, when political discourse, when progressive discourse changes its tune, when the world becomes all peace-loving, it's after World War II, now we want to change our tune as well. We're a decolonization movement. Really? Read your own history. Y'all had a funding bank called the Jewish Colonial Trust, the Jewish Colonization Fund of Palestine. These are actual names of institutions. You can look them up and you will find every single one of them, right? Now, somebody wants to claim, uh, this is like the Zionist devil's advocate in my head that's like, oh, well, they just called it that because back then it was cool to be colonial. They were just trying to appeal to these colonial entities to help them uh, execute their movement. Two problems with this. If you have to appeal to colonial entities to execute your movement, that probably means you're colonial. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like an organization saying we're anti-racist, we're, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, but getting funding from the KKK. If you need to get your funding from the United States or Great Britain or any other colonial project, you are colonial, 
right? But then second, the other problem with it is not just semantics. We see materially how the Zionist project was executed was colonial. Whether they called it that or not, they could say, this is progressive, and their actions could say something totally different. We can just see it by the actions. And, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the Nekba, with the ethnic cleansing operations. I don't have to go into detail about that. Um, so that was, I guess, the first thing that I wanted to, to kind of comment on. Um, and the next thing, you know, the second thing that I want to talk about relating to the way that we understand colonization in Palestine is that the strategy for colonization, a lot of times we have a very stereotypical, very archetypal idea of what colonization has to look like, right? If it's not mass expulsion of everyone, oh, the Zionists, they could kill everyone in Gaza if they want. They didn't kill everyone yet, right? Which is just ridiculous, right? We have this idea that it has to be a certain way in order for it to be colonization, right? That it's more colonial in Gaza than it is in 48, that it's more colonial in Gaza than it is in the West Bank. Let's, let's do away with these ideas. Let's do away with these ideas that there's better colonialism. There is no better colonialism. Colonialism is colonialism. So the strategy in, you know, Israel's very, and I don't want to say smart about their strategy because I don't want to praise colonialism, but they're very um, strategic about the way that they have executed colonialism differently in their respective regions that they have occupation over. Um, and I don't think one is better or worse. I think they're just different. And I think that they function based on the objectives of their project very differently. In 48, the strategy is a lot more covert. The strategy is championing the Jewish majority, which they already laid the groundwork for when they annexed 78% of Palestine in 1948. So there's not a lot of um, expulsions that have to happen there because Palestinians already make up 20% of that population. They already did all of that in 48, right? So their colonialism there is much more covert. They already have this Jewish majority and they champion it through laws like the nation state law, through laws like the law of return, right? Laws that champion that Jews have self-determination determination only. That's verbatim language of the nation state law. That's what it is in 48. Then you go to the West Bank. In the West Bank, their strategy is a lot different. Uh, it's one of trying to maximize a Jewish majority, but also ever think about why Israel has not annexed the West Bank yet. They could if they wanted to, because the West Bank does not have a Jewish majority. And so they're exercising just the amount of control over it to be able to control the land and the resources without having to compromise the basis of their colonial supremacy. That's very crucial. Is 48 better than the West Bank? West Bank better than? I don't think so. I think they're two different strategies. Gaza has a very different strategy. The strategy there, now this is very interesting, was designated as a hostile territory, cut it off from the rest of the region, right? Designated as hostile territory to do two things. One justify the colonial enterprise, right? Oh, Gaza is just full of terrorists. It's full of this, it's full of that. And so we get to continue the very actions that we are glorifying to the world and deeming as something, um, deeming as something that's uh, vital for, for a security state or whatnot, right? Um, and then the second thing is prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state, prevent a discussion of the refugee problem, prevent a discussion of a free Palestine. So I'm gonna, I don't know how much time do I have left? Sorry, I'm getting carried away. <laughs> I'm done. That's okay. All right, can I wrap it up with one thing? I'm done. All right, I'll wrap it up with one thing. I'll wrap it up with one thing. So, I'm always done. I don't know. <laughs> All right, I'll wrap it up with this. So, a lot of people, there's this idea out there that the blockade of Gaza is because of the election of Hamas. There were no Hamas, there'd be no blockade. There would be no Hamas, there wouldn't be any issues. Everything would just be just fine. All right. <laughs> um, Here's what the one thing I want you to take away, take away anything. In 2004, then advisor to uh, former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, his name was Dove Weisglass, he did an interview with Haaretz. And in that interview, he explicitly said, he explicitly said that the purpose of the disengagement from Gaza was to prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state. The, des the uh, disengagement, he said, would be formaldehyde in that it would prevent a discussion of the refugees, prevent a discussion of all the rights of the Palestinians, all their grievances, and they could effectively designate it as hostile territory and not have to deal with it. Remember this, history did not begin on October 7th. History did not begin in the last couple of months. History does not begin with Hamas. It begins with a strategy 
to dismantle the rights of the Palestinian people and assert colonial supremacy. Um, hello, I'm just gonna get started. I'm just gonna do whatever I want. Um, that was really amazing, by the way. Um, uh, I think that as a anti-police uh, activist, that's mainly what I'm gonna focus on. If any of you were hoping for something different from me, um, you should probably just go home now. Um, but I think that um, there's a lot of people in the US who are not only woefully ignorant of just how unchecked the power of police are um, in, in the United States. Sorry, I'm gonna take this off. Um, but they're also completely ignorant of the relationship between our police and our military, um, which is, is possible because of the, the immense amount of propaganda that um, US citizens are, are faced with and indoctrinated with from birth. Um, but uh, some things that I want to point out about the connection between police and Palestine um, is that the US um, and the IOF have a very formal um, relationship in terms of, of policing. Um, post September 11th, the US, under the guise of a counterterrorism initiative, um, sent delegates from the CIA, um, the FBI, the US military, and police forces across the country to Israel specifically to exchange tactics in suppressing dissent. According to the 2018 Deadly Exchange Report, co authored by Jewish Voices for Peace and RAIA, these visits consist of literal live demonstrations of repressive tactics in which US delegates watch Palestinians get brutalized by Israeli forces in real time, in addition to formal trainings on techniques such as the restraint hold that Derek Chauvin used to murder George Floyd. Now, all of us are, are presumably were here in 2020. Who was here in 2020 for the George Floyd uprising? Now, who was in the streets and interacting with police during that time? The tactics are literally the same. The weapons are literally the same. They come from the same place. Raytheon manufactures the same things that they were shooting at us, US citizens, whatever that means, um, that they were shooting at us, they were the same things that were being shot at Palestinians. They were the same, the same tactics were being used. And so during that time, it was really incredible to see, it was Palestinians who were, who were coming to our actions, who were like, you know, you can do this, you can do this tactic to, to resist this particular tactic that the, US, the, the, um, that the police are using against you, that you can, you can use umbrellas to, to uh, deflect um, tear gas canisters, you can, you know, don't touch the tear gas canister because it's gonna be hot. I mean, like, it was, it was an incredible um, show of solidarity, but it was, it was also really horrifying to see that, like, my oppression is being used to manufacture oppression elsewhere. Um, that, that we are being used as lab rats the same way that Palestinians are being used as lab rats in order to more effectively quell our dissent here. Um, and so I think that that's really something that um, folks in the US have to be um, more educated about because it's not just about liberating black people and it's not just about liberating Palestinians because our oppressors are the same people. So we have to be fighting our enemy as though they are the same. Um, additionally, um, I wanna talk a little bit about Atlanta um, because the Stop Cop City movement is something that has gotten less and less attention as time has gone on. Um, I think that people are getting really complacent about the fact that our governments are allowing police forces across the country to essentially build um, like repression training camps. Um, and they're building these not only um, to the detriment of us in terms of, of police brutality, but also in terms of environmental uh, impacts. Um, the Stop Cop City um, uh, movement um, is centered around um, a, a, a parcel of land in Atlanta that is supposed to be protected, um, but that the city has essentially sold to developers in order to develop Cop City. Um, and that is something that police departments across the country um, want to implement and replicate. Um, and they use surveillance tactics um, that are used to infiltrate Palestinian resistance movements. Um, there's something called mosque crawlers, 
um, that are used to spy on dissidents, um, and they're not just in Palestine, that happens here. Um, similarly, we saw a massive amount of cur covert infiltration of the Black Liberation Movement um, by the US police and by white supremacists, and many police departments have created their own surveillance hubs um, modeled after those used in Gaza. Uh, the construction of Cop City is similarly inspired by Israeli training facilities and tactics, not to mention that much of the security tech used at such facilities is owned by Israeli companies. And Palestine is used, essentially, as I said, a living lab to test these technologies and techniques. Um, and if the police are the first line of defense against real change in our country, um, then the military is the second. Um, it's not only that they back the police when we challenge the state, um, but they train and arm the, they arm the police here. Um, since the passage of the 1990 National Defense Authorization Act, the US military has funneled billions of dollars of high-grade equipment, such as LRADs, armored vehicles, and weapons, as part of the 1033 program. A 2020 study of the most militarized departments in the US found that the year after they received the equipment, civilian killings more than doubled. The researchers also found the records of these transfers to be poorly maintained or missing altogether with little accountability on how this often deadly weaponry is being used. And between 2006 and 2014, over $1.4 billion worth of equipment was distributed to American police forces to be used against protesters. In addition, the popularity of so-called warrior training, which is the same training that's used by the IOF to brutalize our comrades in Palestine, um, this has skyrocketed in recent years and across departments in the US. Um, there's an army veteran named Dave Grossman um, who uh, created and popularized the killology training. It is literally called that. Um, and he calls it, quote, the most effective way to stop someone is to fire a bullet into his central nervous system. It is up to God and the paramedics as to whether the man dies. Your job is to stop the deadly threat, and the most effective way to do that is to make the threat die. These are the people that are supposed to be in charge of our public safety. These are the people that we pay to patrol our streets. We pay these people to do this to us. I mean, like, I, I, think, that, I think that something that really trips me up in talking to people, in Minneapolis in particular, is this idea that we can just kind of like kumbaya our way out of this. Like that we, we just need to make better friends with the police. We just need to, we need to increase the, the relationship um, and the exposure that the community has to the cops. We need to expose the community to this, to people who think that protesters should be murdered in the street. I, like, I don't want my tax money to go to this. I, I think that any person of consciousness can understand that the connection between what we are experiencing now in the belly of the beast has ripple effects. What we, what we are paying to our government to do um, not only affects the people around the world, but affects us as like the people who live here. We are, not, we are not any more free in the United States than the people that we colonize. And if one, if one person in a relationship has the ability to kill you with impunity, that's not a relationship, that's oppression. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't go up to a cop and shoot him in the face and walk away unscathed. A cop does that around, around the United States like every couple of days. They just kill someone and face zero consequences. And so what can we do about that? Um, so there are a couple of examples of the deadly exchange that I outlined, um, but that's why in addition to calls to boycott, divest, and sanction, we have to gain community control of the police. Period, point blank. Um, I know that there have been, there've been numerous attempts in our city to um, address public safety. Um, many of them have involved increasing officer training. Um, many of them have involved um, the DOJ report, um, investigations, et cetera. But none of them actually change the power relationship between us and the cops. That is what we need to change. The power relationship between us has to be materially different. And the way that we can do that is through community control. We can not only interrupt the violent, um, the exchange of violent techniques um, and weaponry, but through the establishment of an all elected civilian commission, um, we would be able to outlaw these trainings and the techniques that they teach our officers. And it's imperative that we defund and abolish the American security industrial complex, beginning with the police. But we can't abolish something that we don't control, right? I think that, 
I think that one of the things that was so frustrating about 2020 for me was this idea that like we just need we just need like another we need another reform. We need we need a way for the cops to like see black people and indigenous people and all of the other people that they've murdered for decades in our country. We just need the see we just need them to see them as human beings. Like we just need to change their hearts and minds. Actually, I don't give a shit if the cop sees me as a as a human being. I don't really care how he feels about me at all. What I care about is whether he has the power and the resources to kill me as a citizen who pays his salary, that he has the ability to kill me and get away with it. That's what I care about. I care about whether I'm able to affect the actual things that the police department do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether they are able to evict our unhoused neighbors, whether they are able to issue traf traffic stops to people who are undocumented, like these are actual material conditions that we can change if we actually have real control and power over the police. Um, so if you haven't, I'm pretty sure I'm at time, but if you haven't um, signed our petition yet, um, there are some other people who are wearing these really sexy um, hoodies that are in the audience. Um, we all carry our petitions on us all the time. So if you've yet to sign, please come talk to us and please come talk to us about how you can get involved um, in establishing community control of the police that can not only liberate us, but um, assist in um, stopping the brutalization of people around the world, including Palestine, um, and stop the deadly exchange. So that's it. So I just uh, want to thank the Red Nation and AWC for having this event. Um, it's hard to go after these two. Often, uh, I feel like, uh, I'm just uh, repeating what uh, other incredible activists has, have said. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about resistance and unconditional solidarity quickly, because I think these two covered uh, really uh, a lot of what I was going to say about the colonial project of, of Israel and um, the connection uh, to U.S. police and, and police violence against black, indigenous, uh, immigrant communities of color. Um, but I'm from uh, the Philippines, um, and outside of the indigenous struggle in the U.S., we have the longest-running civil war for national liberation uh, in the world. Um, much like Israel, the United States, uh, the, the, the sitting Philippine government is a puppet government and a client state of uh, U.S. imperialism. Um, and when people in the Philippines attack, uh, mining trucks or, or uh, logging trucks. They're protecting the land that they live on, uh, the, the loved ones they have in the area, um, and all resistance to that kind of imperial domination is justified, whether it's here in the United States, whether it's in Palestine, whether it's in the Philippines. Um, and we are really watching, you know, as we're all gathered here in this room, the, the sort of death rattle of U.S. imperialism and the death rattle of, of Israeli Zionism. Um, and, and that is because of the steadfast resistance of indigenous people in those lands. Um, and we're seeing the United States government's consensus around manifest destiny and imperialism and colonialization fall apart in front of our eyes. Um, the, the, at, at, you know, I, uh, I sort of came into political consciousness around the, the second intifada. Um, and in that period of time, the imperialist nations in, in Europe would go along with whatever the U.S. said. Um, and, and other client states around the world would go with whatever the U.S. said. Um, while the U.N. is a, a completely toothless body, we see over and over and over again U.N. resolutions that Israel and the United States are two of the only countries voting for their violent colonial projects. Um, and, and that sort of international rejection of, of imperialism and domination only happens because people actively resist empire and domination. It doesn't happen because we sit down with our oppressors and gain a better understanding of one another. It doesn't happen because we renamed a department or a country uh, something else and, and we say that'll set us all back to zero. 
um, it happens because people resist. And whether that's resistance like we had uh, in the streets, whether it's people breaking down the literal walls that are encaging them, or whether it's attacking the people who kill and murder and maim your loved ones, that resistance brings attention to the unbearable conditions of genocide, apartheid, and, and imperialism. Um, and, and, you know, I've heard a lot of sort of like internet chatter about, well, why don't people just protest peacefully? Um, and I think we have a really good example here uh, in the Twin Cities. So me and Joe were around uh, when the Minneapolis police killed Jamar Clark. There was a 25-day occupation in front of a police station. There were mass marches for months and nothing happened. In the four years between the time that, George, that Jamar Clark and George Floyd were killed, almost nothing happened on police reform. In the four days that the city of Minneapolis was on fire, we saw more action in those four days than four years of consistent struggle against, against the MPD's violence. And, and, and so it wasn't, it wasn't until radicals and militants in our community decided that the third precinct, and any of you who grew up in South Minneapolis knew this, the third precinct was where they sent their worst officers, their most racist officers, their most corrupt officers. And the community said, this shit isn't safe. And so they burned the, the pig pen to the ground. In, in the Philippines, as, as indigenous lands are taken over and indigenous folks are pushed more and more into the cities, uh, more and more indigenous fighters are joining the armed resistance, and, and they, in turn, are burning down the worst uh, polluters, the worst uh, military and paramilitary offenders in the community, and, and that is what happened um, collectively for, for the people of Palestine on October 7th. Um, and that without, we as, as Americans, people who live in the imperial core, our job is to stand in unconditional solidarity with those resisting oppression. Unconditional solidarity does not mean that we get to say, oh, this tactic you did, we don't really like that. Or we agree with you, but, you know, I think that some of your methods are, uh, you know, too extreme. That's not what an unconditional solidarity means. We live in the core of the empire, so it is our job to demand that our government divest from Israel, divest from the colonial project, and start to free the U.S. as well. Um, and, and so our job is not to critique what resistance movements are doing around the world. It's to stand with those resisting. Um, and I'll just say that, that as somebody who comes out of the labor movement, we send $300 billion a year and have for almost 100 years to Israel for military aid. That is money that we could be using to house some of our neighbors. That is money that we could use to help teach our kids to read and to write. That's money that we could use to fix our roads. It's money we could use to set up a national health care system like they have uh, in Israel. Um, and, and um, you know, so I'll, I'll just end by, by saying that the images that are coming out of Gaza, out of the West Bank, uh, and watching the ethnic cleansing and the pushing out of people and the bombing of children uh, is gut-wrenching and horrible to watch, but that at the same time, we have to hold in our hearts that because of the actions of resistors, because of the actions of those participating in rebellion, the American empire is starting to falter. The Israeli empire is starting to falter. And so what that means is we need to keep our foot on the gas, not let up. We need to be continually struggling so that we get land back, so that we get a free Palestine, so that we get the puppet regime in the Philippines out, so that the United States brings, closes some of those 800 bases around the world, um, and that we start to really repair uh, some of the harm that's been done. So I really appreciate spaces like this that we're able to get together have these sort of uh, uh, exchanges and, and listen 
to uh, the background of other people's struggles. Uh, and so I really do thank uh, the Red Nation neighbor WC for having us. And I thank everyone here for both coming and for your steadfast work uh, over the last 60 days in the streets, on the phones, calling your elected officials, whether it's you know just conversations you're having with your family, all of these things add up to the moment that we're in. And, and so hold in your hearts that we will win, that, that Palestine is a path forward uh, for, for indigenous nations and for all oppressed people, um, and that we will win um, if we stay together and if we, we do resist and we do rebel. Ah, Nijane, that was a beautiful and powerful way to end. Thank you so much. I could have listened to you for way longer um, than the time we gave you. Anyone in the Red Nation want to respond to anything that our three comrades here shared? Or we can turn it over for audience Q&A. Um, one, one last thing that I wanted to say uh, that I forgot to mention during my bit was I mentioned our political position. Uh, Palestine represents an alternative path for Native nations. And that is because um, it's related to our process in time of where we are in settler colonialism. So indigenous people exist in the process of settler colonialism beyond elimination and forced removal, right? And right now we're witnessing Palestine during elimination and forced removal. And that is why we say that Palestine represents an alternative path because we believe in a Palestine where they are not existing in the future like how we exist here on Turtle Island right now. Palestine is an alternative path for land back in revolution. Yeah, just real briefly to respond um, to some of the comments that have been made. The state of Minnesota has never forgiven Dakota people. Has never forgiven, not that we're asking for the forgiveness, but is punishing us still to this day, Ocheti Shakoe people, for daring to live in freedom, for daring to act. And imagine, just yesterday I read the news that there were 700 Palestinians who were murdered by the state of Israel. That is two wounded knee massacres. Imagine the effects that it's going to have. This state can't even deal with the genocide it's committed. So the importance of what has been shared here is that resistance is for life, period. And we should never apologize for that. Uh, so how did the index card thing go? Where are they? Do people have questions? And uh, can we gather them? Will you raise your hand if you have an index card with a question on it? Uh, okay. Uh, I'll just make a quick announcement. Um, this event will be published on the Red Nation podcast. So please look forward to that. We release our episodes every Monday. And because we're publishing on the Red Nation podcast, that means that this is a Red Media sponsored event. You um, I would please support um, all of our organizations. Uh, but if you want to support the Red Nation podcast, please subscribe to our Red Media Patreon. For as low as $2 a month, you get access to uh, bonus content, early release content content, um, all that kind of stuff. Every week we are releasing um, what our most current feelings are uh, at the political moment. Um, we have all kinds of good stuff on there. And if you, uh, if you are indigenous and you want to take a stand, uh, please sign on to the letter that um, on indigenousforpalestine.org. Thank you. And the, uh, the announcements we heard from our indigenous relatives struggling um, against the camp eviction and also the indigenous protectors movement, Red Nation is happy to offer up our platform to uplift any and all of those actions as well. Uh, so we actually have some excellent questions. Um, I think anyone can take a stab at this. So here's one. How do we understand the rise of the far right globally and the shift to openly genocidal tactics and rhetoric in Israel in the context of a settler colonial, unfortunately I can't read this, present. <laughs> a settler colonial present. So 
How do we understand the rise of the far right globally and the shift to openly genocidal tactics and rhetoric in Israel in the context of a settler colonial present? Yeah, I knew you would. <laughs> oh boy. Genocide Joe. There's a reason why a sitting democratic president has went from Jim Crow Joe to Genocide Joe. And I, I know that there are deep fears about you know, right-wing authoritarianism, but I think it's important to put it into context that liberal democracy brought us to this point. And people might get a little bit somehow about criticizing liberal democracy, but I think it's important to remember that these democracies, quote unquote, democracies have been created in the context of active and ongoing genocide. Joe Biden's administration is not a right wing authoritarian administration. It doesn't fall into that camp. It is a liberal authoritarian administration. That might seem like a contradiction in terms, but it's the reality. And we have to, we have to get out of this sort of binary framing of like conservatives, bad, liberals, good. Because this, is ha this didn't happen under the Trump presidency. I'm not saying that Trump was any better than Joe Biden, but there's a reason why it's happening under a Democratic administration. Because their solutions are the same. They have a consensus view about the so-called Palestinian problem. They have a consensus view, they've had a consensus view about the so-called indigenous problem here. There's a reason, I, I, I grew up in the state of South Dakota, and I've heard so many people in Minnesota criticize South Dakota for being racist, and it's like, no, they're not racist, they're honest. Minnesota is racist, and in some ways is more racist than South Dakota. They're just not honest about it, because that's liberalism. And they don't want to hear that because of this Minnesota nice. And that is also a consensus view. That is actually more nefarious, I think, because scratch a liberal and a fascist bleeds. I learned that phrase in Bolivia. I learned that from my indigenous comrades in Bolivia. They said, any person who stands on the stage of a fascist, doesn't matter what politics they claim, they are a fascist at heart. And we learned that. We learned that with Bolivia. Because so many people in the so-called environmental movement in the global north called the first indigenous president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, a genocider. They called him an authoritarian. And then they backed a coup against him and massacred indigenous people. Liberals were literally sharing the stage with fascists. That was the reality. And it was over the question of lithium and resources that that country was beginning to nationalize under an indigenous-led political project. So do not tell me that we have to worry about a Trump presidency again. Do not tell me that we have to worry about the rise of right-wing authoritarianism because we have left, not left-wing, sorry. We have liberal authoritarianism that is our present reality. And any ideology that justifies genocide, as we are seeing in this moment in time, is a morally bankrupt ideology. Do you want to answer that question? Hello. hello is this one hello hello it's not on there it, is. there it is all right it's hard to go after nick but i have a few things i'd like to add um so absolutely echo everything that uh nick just said but one of the things just kind of like historical context and you know framing this in terms of palestine is we've seen empirically that the prime ministers and israeli politicians that are left-wing right-wing Likud or not whatever 
we see the same politics and sometimes even harsher politics, but just in different clothing. And I want to give you actually a clear example. Yitzhak Rabin, former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who's familiar with Rabin. All right, so some of us here. So he was the Prime Minister during the first Intifada um, in the uh, 1980s. And then also he led what is called the Ramla and led the death march in 1948. He led the ethnic cleansing operation of the uh, Palestinian cities of Ramla and Lid. Uh, so first of all, he bragged about that in his memoir, which you can look up online. The Rabin memoirs, it's totally disgusting. But he was known as this diplomatic, peace-loving Prime Minister. He was the one that initiated a policy called breaking the bones of the Palestinian protesters during the first intifada. It literally called for IDF soldiers to break the bones of people that were protesting his policies. And he is known as this lover of democracy, this diplomat, this, this you know, negotiator, this peace-loving dove. And he was anything but that in terms of his policies. Same thing Naftali Bennett, who just preceded Benjamin Netanyahu for his like 7,000th election. Naftali Bennett openly bragged and said, I killed a lot of Arabs in my life. I have no problem with that. We did not see any empirical difference whatsoever. Like it literally felt like when Naftali Bennett was elected, it's like, what's new? Like nothing changed, nothing. So just kind of to solidify that understanding that it really isn't right-wing Israeli nationalism that is the problem. And one more thing, I urge a lot of you to look up an article by Joseph Massad, which is published on Middle East Eye, where he talks about the Third Temple movement going on in Israel. We commonly associate that movement with right-wing nationalism. A lot of the propagators of that movement weren't even religious, by the way. They weren't even religious. This for them was actually much more a colonial project that was irrespective of religion than anything else. So I unite with everything these two comrades said. And I also just want to say, I, I think that we have to ask ourselves when we hear about democracy or, or peace, like who that is for. And, and like Nick was saying, um, bourgeois democracy works if you're very, very wealthy and if you're white. Um, bourgeois democracy has never served black people in this country. Bourgeois democracy has never served native people in this country. Bourgeois democracy has never served women or queer people. Um, and, and so I think sort of these like calls to protect democracy are, are mostly, are a little bit hollow and shallow because, um, the democracy that they want to uphold. And I think this is something that like uh, the, the sort of like the, the liberals um, um, hold up is that like, we want to defend like the democratic, like democracy as a project. And I, I, I think that the Republican party actually doesn't act care all that much about democracy. They care about their party and their ideology. And I think that, that the democratic party's insistence on saving the Republic is a much more fascist and right-wing sort of way to come, come at the policies that um, are very similar between, between Trump and Biden. And I think the, the places where we see online um, liberals offer, well, Biden did this and Trump didn't, is often issues that don't affect the most, mar like the most marginalized communities or the most oppressed communities. I, I think like for Palestinians, it doesn't matter if Joe Biden or, or Donald Trump is dropping bombs. Uh, uh, for people killed by police violence, it doesn't matter if the person who says, well, you know, the guy was a thug and should have been killed, but, you know, we got to love the police anyway, but we should all come together. It doesn't matter if that person's Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Um, we all live under the, the terror and, and, and horrors of not just U.S. imperialism, but also U.S. bourgeois democracy. Yeah, liberalism is bullshit, period, end of story. It is trash and it was founded upon imperialism and colonialism. All it knows is the language of violence and when it doesn't use the language of violence, it uses the niceties like Minnesota nice to cover that shit up. Enough, enough with investing our time in liberalism. That is not resistance. Resistance is the only thing, as David said so clearly, the only kind of death blows to colonialism, imperialism that have happened historically are because indigenous people have resisted 
in the various places where this violence has touched down. And that is what we must all do. As Nick said, we resist for life, period. No more liberalism. I'm actually serious. I see this a lot in the movement. And it's like the single greatest divisive thing. It, it's, like, it's like worms in your brain to believe that liberalism is something that we should be fighting for. If anything, what has happened in Gaza should show us that liberalism is dead. It is dead and we should be happy about that. And we should resist from this point forward because I believe that this is the chapter we are entering into as humanity. Um, and that many of us have already been here <laughs> for a very long time. Okay, so I'm gonna ask one more question because we're a little over time, but we started a little bit late. Um, this one's a little more like, a, I don't know, uplifting? Nay. Okay, how do you hold your endurance? What gives you your strength and what lifts you up when you're feeling down? And this is for anyone to answer. How do you hold your endurance? What gives you strength? And what lifts you up when you're feeling down? Um, I would say that every single day I think about watching black youth standing in front of the burning remains of the third precinct. And like that fuels me every single day that I'm alive now. Because like I think that as a person who was kind of like yeah, also having somewhat of like baby's first political awakening at the time. It's like, I think that it's very easy when you don't have a real understanding of what your politics are to fall into this like pit of despair all the time. I think that that is something that really benefits um, our oppressors because if you don't think that it's possible to resist them, you won't try. Um, but I mean, like, Literally, the third precinct burned because, like, several organizations were like, you know what? Let's not go to the square. Let's go to the source. Let's go to the people who actually did this. Let's have our demonstration there. And then, honestly, the people took care of the rest. Like, we, like, people were, people were so, I think, devastated by a few years prior when Philando Castile was killed because they did what our oppressors told us we were supposed to do. We were supposed to get up there and we were supposed to give all of these emotional appeals about why killing black people after hundreds of years of slavery is messed up and talked about, you know, how, you know, Philando Castile um, followed all the rules. He announced his weapon. He did all of this. His kid was in the car. And then Geronimo Yanis still didn't get sentenced and got a teaching license. So I think that in 2020, it was like, how are you supposed to be a black person and a black youth specifically and like watch this happen again? People literally couldn't do it. And that is what our job is as activists is to lead people out of their frustration and to also like lead them to like the source of what is oppressing them and be like this, kill this, attack this. Because, like, if you destroy this, everything falls apart. If you destroy policing in America, everything falls apart. They are the enforcers of capitalism. They are the thing that props it up and makes it run. If you, if you kneecap the cops, like, what we can do in the imperial core even is, is exponentially multiplied. And so like the fight is possible to win. And there are so many historical examples of people who have fought back. I think about the slave revolts all the time. What our government wants you to believe is that like black people just asked nicely and like we got some like Christian white people to help us out. And you know, like trans people got rights by just like asking cishet people to like, you know, could you please stop like panicking and killing us all the time? You know, like that would be really cool. No, we threw bricks at people. We burned people's houses down. We killed slave masters. Like, it's possible to win. And like, so long as you keep going, like, I think that we can, we can get this shit on lock, for real. You know, I, I, I struggle with this question sometimes because I, I, you know, I think the world is in such a state that um, it feels often very daunting and, and um, very hard to sort of like, we're struggling against the strongest headwinds, the most sort of well-financed empire ever. Um, but I think what we have to keep in mind is the like, 
love we have for our communities and our people. Um, um, and that we're not doing this just because we fundamentally hate, I mean, we do, we fundamentally hate imperialism, we fundamentally hate colonialism, but what that is really driven by is our love for our collective people. We don't want our people to live under these conditions. We don't want our land to live under these conditions. And if, you know, and I, I think that that is what makes left resistance so uh, resilient and, and so strong is that while we have folks like the Likud party, like the American Democratic Party, you know, the alt-right, who are acting off of hatred and a need for more consumption. We are fighting for the people we love. We are fighting for the communities that we grew up in. Um, and we've seen from, you know, the indigenous community here to, to uh, the people in Vietnam resisting uh, uh, American invasion to, to Filipinos resisting Spanish colonization, U.S. colonization, and semi-colonization um, from our own people. Uh, we've seen that in South Africa. We've seen it all over the world. And I, I, all of those rebellions were driven by love and were, were driven by our belief that there is something better to struggle for and that our people hold the answers. We don't need million-dollar, uh, you know, politicians to tell us uh, what we need. We also don't need uh, well-funded nonprofits to tell us what we need. We hold the solutions within our own communities. Um, and, and I also just think this gets into something that I didn't say earlier, but I want to, which is that, um, you know, on the, I think the, it was very interesting listening to you talk about how they openly talked about Israel as a colonial movement at first, and now we have seen a, a huge switch. Um, but our indigenous relatives in, in America stayed and they fought and they fought and they fought for this land uh, and they loved the land in doing so. And, uh, if, Israel, if, if the Israeli government, if, if Israelis were indigenous to Palestine, they wouldn't be burning olive trees. They wouldn't be pouring cement in the aquifers. They also wouldn't be getting on flights and going back to New York or somewhere in Europe. Um, and that, but all of that is based on love love of their communities, love of their families, love of the land that they come from. And that's the only way that our struggle will be realized and that our struggle will be grounded in what matters, is if we love on each other. And that also means getting to know the other folks in our community. All of our struggles are interconnected. The struggle for housing, the struggle against U.S. imperialism, the struggle against police violence. Um, all of those are, are intertwined. And I also think it's important for us to look to organization um, and that, like, we have to be, as leaders, we have to act as headlights for people. We can't act as taillights. We have to lead people out of their frustration. So we can't just say, we want Israel to stop bombing Palestine, or we want police to stop killing black people. We have to give people an alternative. We want a free Palestine. We want the right of return. We want community control of the police. We have to join organizations and come together so that we can develop we can develop campaigns that are based in the masses, that are based out of the people, and that we have the, the um, resources and, the, um, uh, and sort of the connectedness to carry out the things that, that we talk about every day. And so I would say, again, love on your people. Join an organization, whether it's the Red Nation, whether it's the Anti-War Committee, whether it's Freedom Road, whether it's any of these groups that are AMP, I'm also a member of AMP. Uh, I, you know, and I, I just think um, we, we always have to keep that uh, as the bottom line of our work. And, and we always have to do our work collectively and come together so that, that we have a community that, that we can share our grief and our, our incredible, incredible victories with. And I will leave you just with, um, the image that sticks in my head is the the image of the bulldozer and the the border wall um, and a bunch of kids cheering behind it. And then also of a bunch of teenagers. And I went to South High. I know what the cops did to kids outside of the school, like cheering in front of a burning precinct. And like, we will win. We will burn down all of these institutions that, that seek our domination and, and seek our destruction. Um. Just, 
this this question was posed to a movement elder of ours named Madonna Thunderhawk, who was uh, who is still a leader of the American Indian movement, and she faced immense amount of you know repression. Um, she fought for her families. The you know she fought against Indian child removal. She created alternative programs, and this was posed to uh, her by actually one of our comrades, Jen Marley, um, back in 2018, I believe. And her response was actually quite fascinating because she said, somebody in the past knew that I would be here today. And they fought for my existence today. They may not have achieved liberation in their time. They may not have been free, but they knew that they had to be a good ancestor to future generations. And we have to remember that that gives me hope that the indignity expressed by the global South when Israel begins its genocidal bombing campaign, the way that indigenous people have mobilized shows that there is an unbroken, continuous line of resistance and of ancestors who are fighting for future generations. And we have a saying as like Lakota people, as Dakota people, that we are only here to ensure the coming of the next generation. That is not fatalistic, but I want to be a good ancestor to future generations. What, what that means right now is building power. And it's not just about voting. It's I, all the things that were mentioned, join an, organizo join an organization. The power lies within us. We, we need to be unafraid. We need to attack this present condition, the, this nightmare reality, because we are refugees of a future, of a planet that we know can exist. We know that we are exiles from that future currently, but someday, somewhere, our descendants, whether biological, whether social, whether they pick up one of the books that were mentioned today, will remember that we, were, we did everything that we could in our power to ensure that there would continue to be life and justice and freedom. In our speech, um that Justine read, that we uh, read at the, the, the DC March for Palestine amongst, in front of 600,000 people. One of the things I wrote in there at the, at the very end of the speech was which means like through kinship, we are strong. And I always joke, I always joke in the Red Nation. I just, I just pull out just like random ass movie quotes mainly from like Planet of the Apes or like Lord of the Rings. But Ep and Nehidzit, through kinship we are strong, is quite literally like apes together strong. You know, like we, we, we don't, we don't, we don't, it was, it was, it was actually wild seeing some of my, some of my comrades or some of my relatives when uh, October 7th happened and then like the weeks following it's just like oh god like we're gonna be like on the brink of like global war like you know nuclear like nuclear like bombs are gonna start dropping now and just there was like this sense of just like dread and I didn't understand especially people that I thought were that I had like a political understanding of like I don't know like decolonization or like what's happening in Palestine like I thought like this would be like an uplifting moment. It's like, wow, like this is actual, Justine said this, like Palestine is doing like a land back. Like they're, they're actually doing like what we think that we want to do, but we haven't gotten there yet. But Palestine is just doing it right now. And for, uh, for me, that was just like, that was beautiful to see. That's like, wow, like I want to be that cool distance to be so strong i want our fire as people to be so strong that we just take back what is ours so for the people that feel i don't know disempowered or like kind of like 
doomsday prepping and buying like all this ammo and like building like underground shelters in their houses like there's no need for that like <laughs> i don't know like for for indigenous people it's just like we've been there before and we're still here like we didn't have loads of ammo and like underground shelters and like we just hid from the world like we're still here and to support our relatives in palestine through to support our black relatives our queer relatives to do it together and to see that empire is falling like it's what justine also said is like we're seeing the u.s crumble we're seeing israel crumble like they're like shaking in their boots and they know it and doing that resisting together and knowing that this history of resistance, especially as an indigenous person, knowing that my my ancestors survived Huelde, and for me to be here, I want my future generations to also be there. And it happens through the resistance of Palestine. It happens through the liberation of Gaza. And like what we say is like, when Gaza will be free, when Palestine will be free, we will all be free. And to see like, we're at this moment in time of seeing like, okay, like this is actually like possible. We can see it. We see it in our youth. They're more, I have like little cousins that are like eight to 12 years old that have TikTok and they have an understanding of like decolonization and resistance when I learned that shit in college. Like, you know, like <laughs> it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. So how can you not, how can you not feel like hopeful? But I don't know. I would also just say, like, re like just watch or read, like, Lord of the Rings, because that's what also gets me through the day. <laughs> um, thank you so much for those words, comrades. Uh, yeah, we blitz all night. Nay, that's just because our ancestors did. And it's like, it's like what Nick said. Um, we all know that we are only here because they did what they did, and they never gave up. And that's what we're gonna do for the future generations. End of story. And there's so much power and strength in that. You can trust that. You can trust this. That's, that's what steadfastness means. You can trust that people who have lost almost everything are still here and going hard. You can trust that. There's nothing else you can trust, you can trust that. And that's what gives me hope. And I see it in so many, not just indigenous people, but I see it in so many people. Um, that's that's it. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Give everyone a round of applause. Uh, if you if there are people who weren't able to make it tonight or the live stream, I think we're going to turn this into a podcast episode on the Red Nation main feed. Um, it'll also be available on the Red Nation's YouTube channel. Please share it far and wide. Um, again, thank you for coming. Take some extra food. Take a Watecha plate <laughs> home with you if there's more food left. But yes, everyone, travel home safely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do we need?